Hello everyone, welcome back to Dekin Cuts. So the Patnam 2025 has just taken place on 6th December and today we'll be taking a look at the first two problems which are problems A1 and A2. Now these two problems are actually quite approachable and the solution is quite short. I will even describe them as cute problems. And why? Well, you will see when you take a look at the solutions. So without further ado, let us take a look at these two problems. So for problem A1, we have a number theory problem as follows. Let M0 and N0 be distinct positive integers. For every positive integer k, define mk and nk to be the relatively prime positive integers such that this holds. So basically from the previous mk-1 and nk-1, you form this fraction and then you reduce it to the lowest term to get mk and nk. You are supposed to prove that 2mk plus 1 and 2nk plus 1 are relatively prime for all but finitely many positive integers k. In other words, when forming this fraction, you are already going to get numerator and denominator relatively prime to each other, except for finitely many times. So let's take a look at an example first to better understand the problem. Yeah, so let's say you start off with uh, m0 as 2 and n0 as 27. So you have this and then as m0 over n0 and then let's form m1 over n1. So to do that, you first multiply by 2 and add 1 to both the top and bottom. But in this case, uh, this fraction can be further reduced to 1 over 11. So actually m1 and n1 are 1 and 11. So continuing, you can um, get m2 and n2, and then again you double and add 1, so you get m3 and n3. Again, it's already in simplest form, but if you do it again, you realize you get uh, 15 over 95, which can be reduced to 3 over 19. Yeah, so this 3 and 19 are then uh, your next m and n terms, and so on. So basically you see here that, okay, I have one time where I need to do reduction, which means it's not relatively prime. And I have another time where I need to do reduction, so it's not relatively prime. But the claim is these scenarios only happen finitely many times, no matter what you start off with. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into the solution because the solution is actually quite short. The key to this problem is to actually look at the difference between the numerator and denominator. And why is that so? Well, for one thing, when you move from the previous term to the current term, what you do is first you construct this fraction, right? And notice that in constructing this fraction, your difference is multiplied by 2 because you multiply m and n by 2 and then you add 1. But adding 1 doesn't do anything to the difference. Okay, if it's already in simplest form, then that's what happens to the difference. But if there's a common uh, divisor between the numerator and denominator that is bigger than 1, then basically you are going to reduce it to simplest terms, but then this means the difference is divided by that greatest common divisor. Now, the key observation here also is that this common great, uh, greatest common divisor is between the odd number and odd number, so it has to be odd. Okay, so what you do here is that your difference is divided by some odd number. So you see what's, what's the problem here now? Each step, you definitely multiply by 2, but whenever this condition is violated, you divide the difference by an odd number. However, the difference can only be divided by such an odd factor only finitely many times. Well, you start off as some number, but you only keep gaining factors of 2 while dividing out only odd factors. So, well, this means that this condition can only be violated only finitely many times. And that's it, a very, very short, simple solution. So I hope uh, A1 is indeed something that you we will find approachable. Now, let's take a look at the next problem, problem A2, which is another delightful little uh, present. So for A2, we have an uh, analysis problem, but basically it's just the study of functions and you don't need to be too worried about the term analysis. So let's take a look at the problem statement. Find the largest real number A and smallest real number B such that this inequality holds basically AX pi minus X less than or equal to sine X less than or equal to BX pi minus X. And you want this to hold for all X in the interval 0 to pi. Okay, so uh, let's try to sketch the function first. So sine X looks like this. 
from 0 to pi is just a bump like this. And well, this quadratic over here, I'm going to just replace the a and b by k first to be general. So this quadratic here has zeros at 0 and pi. So it's also a parabola that looks like this. So I think this is quite a, a cute little problem. You basically want to uh, find the k such that you just nice fit your sine x between the, the k equals a and k equals b parabolas. Yeah, I, I, that's quite an interesting and creative problem. And thankfully, it's actually quite uh, approachable as well. Now, what is the key idea here? The key idea is you want to know how fast the functions are going up relative to each other, which means looking at the derivative is going to be very useful because how fast is the function rising? That's controlled by the derivative. So let's sketch the derivative out as well. So sine x differentiated is cosine x. Now notice I only do until pi over 2 and why is that? Well, basically for the original problem, I can just try and make this work for 0 to pi over 2 because the two functions are symmetric about pi over 2. So for the rest of this solution, I'm just going to focus from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so what's the derivative of this then? So just a direct differentiation is k pi minus 2kx. And this is just a straight line uh, with, inter uh, with y intercept k pi and then it has a 0 at pi over 2. You can just uh, plug in to check. So notice this pi over 2 and pi over 2, that's very nice. So basically you have a straight line that will start here as well and it will go uh, steep or less steep depending on the value of k. Okay, so with this you can actually pretty much figure out the rest of the solution. So for completeness, I'm just going to uh, uh, write out the solution in a way that is more formal. So firstly, I claim that if a is 1 over pi, then the desired inequality holds for all x in 0 to pi over 2. Now when a is 1 over pi, recall that the intercept uh, for the straight line is at a pi which is equals to 1. So the, curve, the line here fits very nicely uh, below the cosine x uh, curve. And indeed, cosine x is concave on 0 to pi over 2 and then the two endpoints here uh, are the same. So this means that cosine x lies above uh, the derivative which is the yellow line here. So cosine x greater than or equal to f prime x on 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so remember this yellow line here is basically the derivative, uh, so it's actually f prime x. Okay, then what do we have? This means therefore that, I mean intuitively, if the yellow line lies below the blue line, as you integrate from left to right, your area accumulated from the yellow line is going to be less than the area accumulated from the blue curve. And the area accumulated is basically how fast the function have risen from zero. So indeed, in a more explicit terms, sine x, which is the integral from zero to x of cosine t, the blue curve, is going to be greater than or equal to integral of f prime t, and this is equal to fx. So indeed, sine x greater or equal to fx as desired. Okay, and what happens if a is bigger than one over pi? Again, quite uh, intuitive. The intercept a pi is going to be bigger than one, and this means that at for some starting part, uh, the area accumulated is going to be bigger for the yellow one than the blue one, which violates my inequality, and indeed. Uh, formally, for some epsilon greater than 0, we know that because it starts off at bigger than 1, so uh, for some epsilon greater than 0, this part here will all be strictly bigger than 1, which is bigger than equal to cosine x. So again, by doing the integral from 0 to epsilon, we conclude that f epsilon is bigger than sine epsilon, which violates my inequality. So the conclusion here is the largest a that works will be 1 over pi. Okay, and now let us find the smallest real number b such that this inequality holds. I claim that if b equals 4 over pi square, then basically the inequality holds. Now where did this 4 over pi square come from? Well, let's think about this uh, more carefully. So basically, uh, when b is 4 over pi square, the whole point here is that the intercept here is 4 over pi. And why do we want the intercept to be 4 over pi? Well, basically, let's think about it. Uh, we want the area accumulated by the yellow triangle to at least not drop below sine pi over 2, right? I mean, if this 
uh, B is extremely large, yes, your, your curve will go super high up. Then what's the smallest it can be? As you decrease B, it will come a point where your uh, area accumulated will fall below sine pi over 2. So by equating, basically, uh, you want f pi over 2 to be the same as sine pi over 2, you will be able to back solve it and find that 4 over pi works. Yeah, so that's just some motivational speak, but how do we actually prove that this inequality holds for all x? Well, it's again quite straightforward. Basically, 4 over pi here is bigger than 1. So at the start, the yellow curve or yellow line lies above the blue curve. Now, the yellow line f prime x will intersect cosine x only once at some x 0 between 0 and pi over 2. So from uh, 0 to x 0, it is evident that the yellow accumulated area is bigger than the blue accumulated area. So my fx is going to be sitting above uh, sine x by the same integration argument. Now what happens after x0? You start to get negative accumulate, uh, or rather the relative area becomes uh, negatively accumulated. So you will start to close the gap between your fx and sine x. But the worst case scenario happens when you accumulated all the negative area all the way up to pi over 2. So for all x between x0 to pi over 2, the difference in area accumulated is bigger than or equal to at the end where you accumulated fully the negative uh, area. But this, as we, uh, I mean that's the whole point of setting b equals to 4 over pi squared, this thing by construction is equal to 0. So once again, we have the desired inequality. So this is quite an interesting little argument. And lastly, of course, uh, if b is smaller than 4 over pi square, then I mean the inequality fails even at pi over 2 because the area accumulated is going to be less than 1, which is sine pi over 2. So, conclusion, smallest b is 4 over pi square. Yeah, so that's it for problems a1 and a2. I would say that the logic involved is really simple and straightforward and all of them are almost one step to the end. So. I hope you enjoyed these two problems and there are more Patnam 2025 problems coming. So stay tuned to the channel and see you soon.